Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Coastline Community Church and welcome to our service meditation uh, for this Sunday, which is the 5th of September. That's crazy, isn't it, that we're already into September. And as time passes, we are starting more uh, things back in the building. So let me just run through a few of those with you um, before we get into today's meditation. Um, as with every Monday, um, there will be the guitar group, um, seven o'clock here at Coastline, followed on Tuesday by the craft group at two o'clock. Both of those you're really welcome to come to, uh, no booking necessary, um, so just come along and get involved. On Wednesday evening, we have the prayer meeting. Um, that's gonna be in the cafe as well. That's at seven o'clock. It'd be lovely to see you along to that. If you can at all make it, I do urge you to come along to that um, and pray with us. Every Friday, um, we will continue through September uh, the drop-in group um, where we can come in for prayer, for tea, coffee uh, and chat as well. Um, so if you'd like to come along to that, it's 11 o'clock until 2 o'clock. You can come any time within those times. No need to book for that. Um, we would ask that you would wear your face masks and stuff as you come into the building and do the hand sanitising and all that kind of thing. Uh, and then you can go to your table. A um, couple of notes uh, for things that are coming up in the next few weeks. Um, the 15th of September will be our members meeting, 7 o'clock here. Uh, and the 16th of September um, will be the youth team meeting at 7 o'clock where we'll be discussing Sunday school, uh, youth groups, school work, all things youth and families at that meeting. So if you want to get involved with that, please let me know um, or just turn up to the meeting. No need to book for either of those two meetings. Um, both of which are at seven o'clock here at Coastline. What else is going on? Um, this Sunday, the 5th of September, won't affect you guys watching, um, but for those who are coming along, this is the first time where we will be back together um, as one congregation, um, which is going to be wonderful, but it's also going to be challenging. So we're going to try and do it as um, carefully as we can. We've got the seats um, set out in a specific way. Um, we have um, obviously everybody coming back to us um, at 11 o'clock. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a shorter service than the normal coastline service. Um, this is all part of our gradual move back um, to something near normal. Um, so 11 o'clock we'll have a shorter service and there'll be no um, communion other than the first one of the month um, and then in October we hope to move back to something nearer normal. So for the whole month of September, we're going to, just going to have one service um, and that's going to be at 11 o'clock. You'd be really, really welcome along to that. If you'd like to come along, please do so. There's no need to book. Um, you can just come in, um, wear your masks uh, and join with us in worship. All of the other th things we will keep you updated on um, as we go through uh, the month and we'll let you know what is happening in October as the regulations and things change and we can start to have more things back uh, in person too. So let's uh, pray together before we have our readings and before Daniel comes to speak to us on um, our next series that we've started in Revelation. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you um, that you are uh, always with us, that you never leave us and that even through this whole pandemic, you have been there and you have in enabled good things to happen. And we thank you and we give you praise and all the glory um, for those things. Father, we are excited um, and we recognise that some people will be nervous as we move back to one service this week. But we do uh, pray that that would go well uh, and that you would uh, lead us in that. And we thank you that we can come back as one people, as one family um, together in the, for the first time in 18 months. And we do um, thank you for the privilege that it is uh, to gather together uh, as one people of God. And we just um, would pray for Sunday um, that you would be there and that everything would uh, go well and everyone would feel comfortable in being back in one space together. Father, we pray too that you would lead us as we look to the future, as we look to um, begin more things and start back groups um, as carefully as we can. And we pray that you would lead in that. Father, we this morning would pray that 
as we open your word that you would um, be there, that you would um, show us something uh, new of yourself as we look at what is such a challenging book in Revelation. Father, we pray for Daniel as he would open that book uh, and share his thoughts uh, that you have given him uh, with us. Father, we just pray all these things in your name. Amen. Our first reading this morning is taken from the book of Daniel. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 7 and I'm going to read from verse 8 through to around verse 12. Daniel chapter 7 verse 8. I considered the horns and behold there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots and behold in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed, and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. This is the power of Christ and 
Hi, you folks. Our second reading comes from Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 down to 20. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance there in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit in the Lord's day and I heard a voice behind me like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Tarathara, Sardis, Philadelphia, and the Laodicea. When I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with white golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, white like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died. Behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Is it worth it? Why keep going sometimes? What? We've been through 18 months of COVID and we're all tired and weary and a lot of folk are asking that, you know, why bother? The Apostle John, there's a story told in church history of John when he, John was one of the apostles we reckon, even after he wrote Revelation, he was released from Patmos and served to minister for another few years. And when he was in his late 80s, which was an advanced stage of age for people of his time, John had got a young convert, a young man who had been saved under his ministry, come to follow the Lord, and was going on great leaps and bounds in the churches. He was a thief, and he used to be one of the highwaymen up in the mountains, but he got powerfully converted, and he followed John everywhere. And then one day, the guy ran away, disappeared, and John went after him. 80 years of age, he went back to his old haunts, he checked the pubs and the different places, he wasn't there, nobody had saw him. And John and Eddie went up into the mountains, on the mountain passes where the highwaymen were. As he went up one of the passes, he was set upon. He was attacked quite violently. And as he was left lying there, one of the men turned around, who hadn't struck John, but had been involved in it. And it was this young man. And the aged apostle looked at him, and the guy said, why, why did you come after me? Why did you bother? John says something to the fact because Jesus would have done the same for me. So when we come to look at Revelation 1 today, we look at somebody, John was the beloved apostle, disciple. He had nestled his heart in the bosom of Jesus and his, his character reflects a lot of what Jesus gave to him. Now John must have struggled in exile because John loved the churches. The churches we hear about, those different geographical terms, uh, 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 Philadelphia, Laodicea, Sardis, Tarathara. They were churches he went round in a wee circuit. It was like a post route, like a royal mail delivery route, and he went round each of those. He loved them, he ministered them. In Ephesus, there's a grave to John the Elder, he was called. He was separated from the Emperor Domitian, couldn't kill John because John was too influential and that would cause uproar. So he sent him to exile to Patmos. Ten miles out of sea in those days, there wasn't reliable sea connections. Patmos is a rocky outcrop in the Aegean Sea. John can't do much harm there, can I? And it's John's worship in the Lord's day, probably by himself. I mean, it's time when you're by yourself, you do, you do miss that church family around you. And he must have been thinking about the churches. He must have been heartbroken. Because we heard there about the young man, that's the love John had for them. As he's worshipping, a voice as clear as a trumpet. I love that image, a voice like a trumpet. I wish my voice was like a trumpet and loud, but that clarity. John, write down to the churches you're praying about. Send this letter to them as John. Revelation's a very visual book. You can't, it's to stimulate our imagination. You can't draw a revelation literally because if you do, these things just look crazy. But it's, it's metaphor and visual images to really speak to us. That's what apocalyptic's like. It's, it's like visual stuff we see nowadays. And John turns to hear who this clear voice is. And as he turns, and I love this, discouraged, weary, tired, Heartbroken John. Perhaps you feel like that yourself this morning. You've come, well, you're listening to this online. You're feeling completely at your wit ends. You fear your faith may fail. You fear your love has grown cold. John turns and discovers the one who holds him fast. My prayer as you're listening to this now that you will feel the presence through the power of the Holy Spirit, the one who holds you fast, friend, if you're Christ. As he turns, he sees this powerful display. As he looks around, firstly, he sees seven golden lampstands, which symbolise the churches. It's a beautiful image of the church. A, a lampstand, what's a lampstand function? The primary function of a lampstand is to give light, to support the light. That's what churches are. We display God's beauty and glory and gospel to the people around us. A light in the hill shines forth. And these churches are golden lampstands. These small communities that the Roman emperor Partly doesn't care about, but partly is frustrated with because they're preaching radical things like loving your neighbour and caring for the weak and the poor. One of the reasons we have a welfare state in this country nowadays isn't because of the Bevan brothers, it's because of the impulse that the church put in the nation to love and care for those who can't look after themselves. In these small communities, this golden lampstand, this witness of Christ's beauty, as the church comes together, as we see it, who is on our pension credits and is struggling to make ends meet, she shares the love of Christ. Her witness goes forth. As the young mom who's hanging her wits end because her husband's just left her and the kids. As she comes faithfully, heartbroken, shares the love of Christ. This golden lampstand is doing its work. And who is in the midst of them? Who is in the heart of the churches? Who keeps them going? These small, in the world's eyes, pathetic communities. 
but one like the Son of Man, our Lord Jesus himself. One of the Afghan pastors this week, we got a prayer request through. I'm frightened. I'm scared. But I'm holding on because Jesus is with me. Friend, Jesus is in the heart of every true church. He is in the midst. As I preach this, I preach it in the presence of Christ, which as a preacher is an awesome responsibility. As you listen, you listen in the presence of Christ as his word goes out. He is in the midst of every church. He holds us fast. Notice the image there, John talks about he held the seven stars in his right hand. The hand of power, the hand of authority, the hand of support. The church will never fail. Not because of her pastors or her deacons or her leaders or her programs or all these wonderful things. Because he builds his kingdom and the gates of hell don't prevail against it. He sends his light forth and he, look at the description of him this morning. Just bask in this. This is your Lord and Saviour. How do you, do? this is before we look at the description of Jesus. Let me ask you this question. How would you describe to somebody who is blind the most beautiful sunset? Or how would you describe to somebody who has no sense of taste the most delicious fish supper? It's hard to do. It's hard to put into words, isn't it? One of the reasons apocalyptic literature is so, is so confusing to us is it's a lot of descriptive metaphors. How do you describe Jesus? How do you describe somebody whose face is brighter than the sun? His glory floods the place. How do you describe somebody whose love is greater than any human love possible? Shakespeare himself would be like a blithering Egypt trying to describe it. How do you describe the intimacy and tenderness and fatherly support of the one true father? See why John reaches for all these metaphors to try and describe Jesus. His hair is white as wool, white signifying purity, wisdom. No problem is too complex for our Lord. As pastor, I take great delight in that. I don't have to figure out the church as I take it to the Lord who is Lord of the church. Friend, what's going on in your life that you're struggling with? Have you tried prayer? Have you took it to the one whose wisdom is unsearchable? His eyes blaze like fire. Fire denotes holiness, purity, no messing around with. We can't mess around with God. We, we try and act the maggot with him, but it doesn't work. He sees to the heart of us. And that may be scary for some, but actually that's the best thing for us because he sees to the heart, he sees to the problem and he can heal, deliver and restore. What's the point in going to the doctor and hiding your symptoms? Jesus looks at our heart and he sees the problem and he heals, restores, renews if we ask him. His eyes see to the truth of every matter. His eyes see to the struggling and weary. Friend, have you're witnessing to your family and you're going, where am I getting with them? He sees each prayer, he sees each tear, he sees each cry, and he is with you. Don't give up. You're struggling with your church. Churches can be difficult places. Don't give up. He sees. His feet burnished like bronze, that idea that looks again, purity, holiness, justice. People ask me, why do the Taliban exist? Why does evil exist? And I can't give a full detail of this, but one thing we do know this, that God says he has given space for everyone to repent because a day is coming when God will judge the living and the dead his justice will be absolute and pure and unbribable and unavoidable and the only people who will stand on that day are those who trust in Jesus Christ we can't go before God our own mercy. even in our own hearts we know we've messed up we know we've sinned but his justice is also matched by his love because he went to the cross Notice he has the golden sash wrapped around it. Signifies kingdom, authority, sovereignty, holiness. That our king is the one who started his reign on the cross. His heart broken open as he bore the weight of all our sin. Because he loved us, he gave himself for us to the thief on the cross. He could say, friend, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because what he was doing on that cross, as he bore sin, as he bore God's justice for us. And we trust in that cross is sufficient, which it is. And we believe that God raised him from the dead, which he did alive forevermore. Our king is the king who rules from his throne with scar marks on him. Not amazing. He's the one who talks to John in the midst of the churches. He's the one whose heart flows out, whose voice speaks like the roar of many waters. I love that imagery. One of my most, 
that's bad English, but that's it. One of my most favourite things to do is go down to the sea in a rough and stormy day. I love it, my, own thing. my wife thinks I'm mad. I love going down to the harbour and seeing the waves crash over. And It's powerful. There's something about the force of the sea that just, it does make your hair stand on edge and you don't mess around with it. Christ speaks with that power and that authority. He's not weak. He is immensely strong and yet humbled himself in love. What a saviour. And he is putting all things right. Revelation again, this image of Jesus reminds us and he says to the church, he says to struggling Christian, he says to Christian whose faith is failing, I'll hold you fast. I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the firstborn from the dead. I hold the churches in my hand. John, I'm with you. I will see you through. Christian friend, if you're in Christ, he will finish the work in you. He will see you safely home to him. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't be afraid. For he is with you. He is holding you fast. Oh, Christian friend, this morning I pray. Finish this recording. Finish this, the meditation. Listen to the last songs. Go and spend some time in this chapter in Revelation yourself in prayer. He is your saviour and your Lord. He loves you, not with a timid, weak, measured out love, but with a love that's like the roar of many oceans. You're drenched in it. Now, Christian friend, thank you for listening thus far. I don't know why you have, but thank you. This Jesus sees what you're like. He sees your heart. There's no messing around. There's no equivocation. There's no pleading with him. He knows you're rebelled against him. And still he would say to you this morning, trust me, I will forgive you your sins if you follow me, put your heart and hope in me. This love is yours. Isn't that amazing? Let us pray. Lord, I pray what's from the speaker would fall to the wayside, but that folk would hear your voice through mine. Because you, this is your word. And what you have said in it is true. You are the first and the last, the beginning and the end. You hold the churches. Lord, for churches listening to this, strengthen them, encourage them. May they know that you're in the midst of them. If somebody's listening to this like John, they're by themselves, they're lonely, they feel isolated. Oh Lord, may they hear your voice. May they know your love through the power of the Holy Spirit. And for our non-Christian friends, Lord, thank you for them. Bless them and open their eyes to see and trust you as the true King, Saviour and Lord. In your name we pray.